So welcome back, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Hello. <laughs> um, so uh, I decided to talk today a bit about um, an important teaching from the Lotus Sutra, which we chant here every Friday night, or we chant sections of it every Friday night, uh, but in Vietnamese. So I wanted to, to pull out um, this teaching on skillful means which is addressed in chapter two and three. Um, so it's called skillful means. It's sometimes you'll also see in, in English language books on Dharma, you'll see it called skill in means. Uh, one source I looked at called it tactfulness. Uh, the Sanskrit word for this is upaya. Uh, U-P-A-Y-A, -A, upaya. And sometimes you'll see that as well, untranslated, even in English, English books on Dharma. So basically, this is um, an explanation of the different levels of teaching that the Buddha did. So because people have different abilities, different capacities for understanding, um, the Buddha taught in accordance with his audience's abilities. His audience's, yeah, his audience's abilities. So, you know, as I mentioned here, um, just like you don't teach a child to read by handing them Shakespeare, right away. You know, they're learning ABC and you say, now read this. Well, that won't work, will it? It's the same thing with, with us. Um, we need to approach the teachings in a way that's understandable to us. Uh, I think I said to someone a couple of weeks ago, you know, she had a question about, she didn't really understand entirely what we were talking about. And I said, well, you know, the Dharma is like a 10,000 piece puzzle and you have 10 pieces. So we have to put the Dharma together slowly and develop our ability to under, understand the Dharma slowly. We can't start right at the top. So for example, um, there were some people apparently that the Buddha came across who were really attached to the idea of a real self. Remember we talked about this last week or two weeks ago? So people who are really attached to this idea of self, the Buddha said, yeah, there's a self. And conventionally, that's true. Or rather, I could say temporarily, that's true. So I'll use myself again as the example. Hui Hai exists. There is a self that is called Hui Hai. But I have come together because of various causes and conditions, and eventually those causes and conditions will come apart, and so will I. So when I die, Hui Hai ceases. But you know, for people who are really freaked out about that, the Buddha, you know, if he came across that, he would say, yeah, okay, there's a self. And that's not a lie, because there is, temporarily. So this is what we're talking about in skillful means, as an example. <clears throat> so another example would be um, some people um, are really interested in devotional practices. I know a couple of people who come to this English program have said that they just, you know, when we do the chanting, they just really don't feel anything. And what I've said to them is, well, don't worry about it. Um, the original purpose of chanting in the Buddhist tradition was to memorize the Buddhist teachings because they weren't written down at first. It was an oral tradition. And so um, you're learning through the bit of chanting that we do, you're learning some of the Buddhist teachings. You don't have to have this big feeling of devotion. But for someone like that, I, I wouldn't tell someone like that, oh, well, um, you don't feel anything when you chant, so I want you to go and spend the next six months in a retreat in a cave in the mountains and do nothing but chanting. Someone who's not interested in that isn't really gonna to respond to that kind of practice. It might really turn them off from the Dharma. And so there are other ways to approach it. Some people really like to study. And so they'll emphasize studying in their approach to the Dharma. Now, study alone is not enough. I think just, just chanting alone personally isn't enough. If you chant and you don't study, you're sort of doing that practice blindly uh, without any understanding, and that's not particularly useful. There's some merit in doing that because you're imprinting upon your mind the tendency to recite the Buddhist teaching. So there is some merit in that, but you know, just blindly chanting something that you don't understand without, without some kind of Dharma study uh, to, to create a foundation, uh, that's not really enough. But um, you know, so different people have different interests, and so they will approach the Dharma in different ways. This is another way to think of skillful means. Um, so uh, a lot of people, like myself, um, you know, 
Americans born usually to a Christian background. Some people, a lot of um, people who convert to Buddhism in the West are from a Jewish background as well. Um, we come to Buddhism because of meditation. Meditation, or when we think of Buddhism, we think of meditation. Other people don't. So it just depends. It depends on the interests and abilities of, of people, different people, how they should approach the Dharma. But for all of us, when we first come to the Dharma, we have to start here. I see this sometimes um, with, you know, uh, formerly Christian or Jewish converts to Buddhism. Um, they hear about really high teachings, um, these really difficult high teachings, and I experienced this in the Tibetan tradition where they have all these different levels of teachings, these levels of practice, and they want to start right at the top. Um, they want to skip all the, all the foundational stuff and just go right to the top because they think they're so ready for it. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't really work. I remember hearing the story of a nun, an American nun in the Tibetan tradition who went to India, and some, some Tibetan Lama, for some reason, had taught her this really high practice. And so she was doing that, and basically she started going crazy in her retreat. It was partly the isolation of retreat, too, I think, but she was starting to go crazy. And so she was asking all these other Tibetan Lamas, you know, what should I do, what should I do? And they said, stop doing this practice. That's what you need to do. Stop doing this and just, you know, um, do this other meditation practice that focuses on Avalokiteshvara, Kwante Ambotat. Um, you know, Friday nights here we chant Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. That's a, that's a mantra for Kwante uh, Ambotat. So just, you know, just do that practice. <coughs> Excuse me. Start from the beginning. She didn't listen, and she went nuts. Literally, she lost her mind, from what I understand. There was a story of another woman who already had a lot of anger, and she was doing um, what the Tibetans call wrathful practices. If you've ever seen Tibetan religious paintings, some of them look kind of scary. They've got fangs and sort of crazy wild faces. That's not, those aren't demons. Um, this, this sort of angry kind of imagery is about um, forceful energy, sort of cutting through delusion, cutting through ignorance. That's what that's about. It's not, it's not actually about anger. They just use that sort of imagery. Well, she was doing, she already had a lot of anger, though, and she was doing this wrathful practice. And um, eventually what happened was she kept getting angrier and angrier and angrier because she wasn't ready to do that. And so instead of cutting through her ignorance, it was only increasing her anger. Um, she got upset with her husband, and she took an axe to his, like, really expensive mountain bike and destroyed it. And eventually then her husband and her kids left her. They said, we can't take this anymore. And she wouldn't listen to anyone. People were telling her, stop doing this. This isn't helping you. Stop doing this. She wouldn't listen. So um, we need to practice in a way that we're ready to practice. We need to push ourselves a little bit. But we need to practice in a, in a manner that we're ready for. And understand that we have to start from the beginning and slowly build our Dharma practice. <clears throat> So then in, in chapter 3, we see the parable of the burning house. This is my favorite parable. There are several, I think, eight major parables in the Lotus Sutra, and this is my, my personal favorite. So uh, the story goes that there is this man, an elder, and um, he has several children who are playing in their house, and he sees that the house has caught fire, but the kids don't notice. Um, the kids are still playing with their toys, so the, this elder is outside, and he says, you know, come out, come out, the house is burning, you have to come out. And the kids are like, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. Um, so then he says, well, you know, uh, he remembers that they want, some, they want to have some toy carts to play with, and so he says, you know, hey, I've got these great carts out here for you. If you come outside, you can have them. And he describes them a little bit, and the kids are like, hey, that's great, and they're stumbling over one another to get outside. Imagine um, if, you, um, if you have kids in a house or somewhere, you're taking care of some kids, and uh, you say, hey, come here, and they're playing with their toys. They might be like, mm, maybe if we don't say anything, she won't notice that we're ignoring her, right? But then you say, hey, I've got some chocolate for you. They'll be elbowing each other out of the way, running to get that chocolate first, right? So this is what the Buddha is doing here. The Buddha, obviously, is the elder, the father. 
<clears throat> so he says, come on outside, I've got these carts for you. And the kids go running outside, but what they find aren't the carts that they thought they would find. They find these unbelievably luxurious, amazing, really you know, expensive carts that they just, if the Buddha had said, if their father had said, hey, come out here and describe what these carts were really like, they wouldn't have believed him. It's like if you tell the kids, you don't just tell them there's chocolate. If you tell them, come into the kitchen, there's this three-dimensional palace made entirely of chocolate. You know, you use Hershey bars and glue it together with frosting, and there's a river of chocolate pudding around it. You know, it's filled with candy. What do you, if my mom said that to me when I was 10 years old, that there was this three-dimensional palace of chocolate in the kitchen, I would have been, yeah, right. I'm just going to keep playing with my toys. So the Buddha knew, the father here knew, that if he, if he told his kids the whole truth, they wouldn't have believed him, and they would have burned in the house. And so instead, he, he told them something that was true, but that they could believe, that they could grasp with their minds. And so then they came running out of the house, and then they saw the real truth, which was obviously a metaphor for the fullness of the teaching, the complete truth of the teaching. So they find these wonderful cards. And so in this way, <clears throat> you can see again how the Buddha is using, uh, this is a metaphor for provisional teachings to lead people along the path. Now there's something else that, um, that this, this sutra teaches. This is in this next section. Um, the sutra says that even those who practice preliminary teachings will, will eventually achieve enlightenment. Because before this sutra was taught, people believed that if you were practicing provisional teachings, if you were only interested, say, in your own personal liberation from the cycle of birth, old age, sickness, death, and rebirth, that's all you were ever going to achieve. But in this sutra, this is the first time that the Buddha taught, no, people who, per, who practice <coughs> these provisional teachings will ultimately be led to the bodhisattva path. Bodhisattvas, remember, are these uh, beings of tremendous compassion and wisdom. They're like saints in the Buddhist tradition. They're these beings of tremendous compassion and wisdom who not only are working for their own enlightenment, but they work in the world reaching out to other beings who are suffering, helping to teach them and lead them along the path. And so even people who are on the path to individual liberation will ultimately become bodhisattvas and then fully enlightened Buddhas. What happens is um, someone on the path to individual liberation, um, they achieve a certain kind of enlightenment where they, they do in fact escape from uh, the cycle of birth, old age, sickness, death, and rebirth. And then they're resting in this state beyond birth and death, this sort of peaceful state. And eventually, though, the Buddha comes to them and says, hey, wake up. You're not finished yet. You need to go back and cultivate great compassion and even greater wisdom and help other beings along the path, and then you will achieve full enlightenment. But some people, if you tell them that from the beginning, they just don't respond to that. They can't wrap their heads around that. And so pushing them in that direction right from the beginning wouldn't be useful, right? So the Buddha taught this other path to help lead them ultimately to the path of the Bodhisattva and to full Buddhahood. So this is the last line here that I want to address also. Um, some traditions take this teaching on skillful means to also mean that seemingly bad behavior can actually be enlightened behavior designed to lead beings to enlightenment. Theoretically, this is possible. Now, if you stick around the Dharma long enough and you hear enough Dharma stories, you might hear a story of some Zen master, for example, um, who's you know, having a conversation with his disciple and then he takes off his sandal and he hits the disciple over the head and then the disciple becomes enlightened. Right? The master sees that this is the last thing. Words aren't going to do it, so he just shocks him out of his ignorance with you know, whacking him over the head hard with the sandal, and then the disciple becomes enlightened. Now, normally, monks are not supposed to hit anyone, right? So this would be an example of seemingly bad behavior, but that's actually very compassionate. So theoretically, this is possible. Theoretically, this is possible. 
Unfortunately, and this is my personal opinion, and I think, and I'm addressing this less to those of you, because all of you are really connected to the Vietnamese tradition, where I don't think we see this problem. Um, there are some other Buddhist traditions where this has become a problem, though. And th again, this is my opinion. Uh, so I'm addressing this more to people watching this on, on video. Um, but where there are supposedly enlightened teachers who are engaging in some really terrible behavior. And we've seen scandals, uh, even here in this country, both with American-born teachers and those that have come from Asia in different Buddhist traditions. You know, um, Usually men, though not always, in a couple of cases there have been women who are supposedly enlightened masters, some of them supposedly monks, but they sleep with their students. Um, some of them are in traditions where they're allowed to marry, so they're married, but they cheat on their wife and sleep with their students. We've seen some problems like this. I had some friends who were practicing in, in a community many years ago like this, and it finally all exploded, and they left. They just left. They couldn't stick around anymore. They still practice the Dharma, thankfully. What I've seen happen, though, is people suffer through these kinds of things, and not only do they leave that teacher, that community, they quit the Dharma completely, which is unfortunate. Because the problem isn't the Dharma, the problem is that supposedly enlightened teacher's behavior. Unfortunately, what happens in some of these cases is that the students suffer, the people around them are suffering because they see this behavior that's clearly, that's bad, but uh, you know, somebody's telling them it's really just the teacher's crazy wisdom. This is their enlightened activity. So the students are suffering and then someone else says, oh no, the teacher's not the problem, you're the problem, you're just not enlightened enough to understand. This is what happens sometimes. So again, this is my opinion. People who practice in some of these traditions that recognize this more will strongly disagree with me. Um, but I'm saying that as a warning to people who might get involved in other Buddhist communities. Uh, that uh, in my opinion, again, this teaching has sometimes been twisted to justify really bad behavior. So keep that in mind. But originally, if we look at how this teaching on skillful means or skill and means is presented in the Lotus Sutra, it's really not about this crazy behavior that's actually enlightened behavior. That's not what it is. It's the use of provisional teachings, simpler teachings, that will eventually lead to higher and higher teachings, a higher understanding of the Dharma, a more in-depth understanding of the Dharma. That's what skillful means uh, was originally about. So, that's the teaching on skillful means. And I'd like to see if anyone has any um, questions about this or anything else. Oh, before, before we do that, though, um, I may, uh, a request came through email. You know, I said, you can email me if you have ideas for Dharma talks or anything. And I, I forget who it was, but somebody suggested that I, I speak from some of the sutras. And so I may do a couple of more weeks um, pulling teachings from the Lotus Sutra, but I won't spend all of our time on that because we don't have a whole lot of time. So again, if you have ideas for Dharma talks, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Okay. So now let me see if there are any questions. Yes. Is the Lotus Sutra only in the Mahayana tradition, not the Theravada? Yes, the, the Lotus Sutra is one of the main uh, Mahayana sutras. It's not recognized in the, in the Theravada tradition. So they think it's whack or whatever they think? Um, I, I don't even think, I, I don't even know of a Theravada master who, who's even looked at this. I mean, they've got, they've got plenty of material in the Pali Canon to, to last you a lifetime. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of like a specific response to this specific sutra from the, from the Theravada tradition. Yes? Okay, uh, in the chapter three, mm -hmm. The burning house. Well, there's a famous line from the sutra. At the end of this parable, it says, all the world is a burning house. Why do you want to stay in it? So the burning house, in the sutra, it makes it sound like the burning house is samsara, right? The world in which we live. <clears throat> actually, though, the burning house isn't the outer world. What's actually burning is our minds. Our minds are on fire with ignorance and the suffering that that ignorance causes. So that's really what the burning house is, right? Yes? Uh, I read chapter two, 
that when somebody uh, like when somebody's trying to begin teaching us civil means stuff, sometimes the I think it meant I think I meant I think it meant that somehow saying that uh, people should to be taught differently and how to understand it, right? Yeah, basically it's so you, you speak to people where they're at. Um, so someone who's just starting out, you wouldn't give a lecture on the Dharma um, on the um, Avatamsaka Sutra's teaching um, of mind only, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you wouldn't do that without, very, without doing it in a very basic way, very carefully explaining the vocabulary. Um, you know, my talks, if I use a Sanskrit word, I explain it. I tell you what it means. I don't just assume that you know it. So, <clears throat> yeah, so it's about starting where people are at so that they can understand. Other questions? <clears throat> yes? Is Sanskrit similar to Pali in pronunciation? Is there slight variations on the spelling, or is it... Um, Sanskrit, it's my understanding that Sanskrit is an older language than Pali. Pali derives from Sanskrit. Pali is also a simpler language grammatically. Um, so, but there, is a lot, there are a lot of similarities. So um, we use the word sutra, which is Sanskrit, but in Pali it's sutta, with no R. We say karma, they say kamma. We say dharma, they say dhamma, so there's no R. Um, so, but it's, it's my understanding that Pali is a later language that derives from Sanskrit and is, and is somewhat similar, simpler. Most of the terms I use are Sanskrit. Sometimes things are in Pali. That's, this is one of the problems with, you know, Dharma in America right now is that depending on the source we're looking at, looking at it will give us a term in Pali but not the equivalent in Sanskrit or vice versa, or it won't give us the Pali or Sanskrit at all. Um, so things are a little mixed up. Uh, I remember when I was practicing in the Tibetan tradition, there were the names of some of the bodhisattvas. We used the Tibetan name. We were just in the habit of using the Tibetan name. But for other bodhisattvas, nobody knew the Tibetan name. We were all using the Sanskrit names. So it gets a little mixed up. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. There. Oh, yes. What is that devotional practice mean? Uh, devotional practices would be a lot of like, you know, bowing and chanting, uh, you know, namo aida This would be considered devo a devotional practice. Um, circumambulating, like we do when we do the walking meditation. For us, it's walking meditation, but it's also kind of devotional in that we're walking around the Buddhas or walking around uh, stupa. What is the word for stupa? Tap? Top, top, yeah, walking, or, you know, we walk clockwise around the top or around the Buddhas. This, these are all kinds of devotional practices. How about vegetarian? Eating vegetarian? Eating vegetarian. You could think of that as a devotional practice. It depends on how you approach it, I think. I think uh, vegetarian has been the from the compassion. We call, you know, we cannot uh, kill it. So we don't want to kill, just mean eat vegetarian. To keep the, the, the precept, first precept, mm -hmm. killing to eat. You know, you can take this precept carefully. You can eat anything without to kill the animals. Yeah. For our compassion. But you could, it, I suppose if someone thinks of this as part of their devotion to Amitabha Buddha, it could be considered a, vo a devotional practice, yeah. Okay, so we'll stop there uh, with the Dharma talk today, and um, I'll give some short instruction in meditation. <clears throat>